Hello everyone, this is Jim Butler. I'm a hotel lawyer with a firm called Jupper, Bangles, Butler, and Mitchell. We want to welcome you to our Meet the Money webinar today. Meet the Money uh, has been a national hotel finance program that we've done as an annual hotel conference for 30 years. The first week of May this year would have been our 30th program, but the COVID uh, problems presented, prevented us from holding it. So we've done a series of these online roundtables to present some of the valuable information that would normally be at Meet the Money. And today is one of those. Today our focus is on CNBS Special Servicing FAQs. We're going to try to answer some of the questions that borrowers, investors, various stakeholders have. And uh, I make the analogy or comparison that if this were a college course, this is not the introductory 101 of the basics. Uh, get that someplace else. This is the 201 or 220 uh, graduate uh, version where we're going to dig into uh, dig into some practical realities of what's actually going on. We've got a wonderful panel. I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves and ask them to give the longer introduction. So uh, starting with Kurt Spa, please uh, give your name, your title, tell us what your company does, give us a little sense of what your position is in the industry and what are you doing right now? What are the things you're working on? Uh, Kurt, let me pass it to you. Thanks, Jim. I'm Kurt Spa. I'm with Citus uh, Company, Citus AMC and I'm in the special servicing area. Uh, I'm a senior director. Um, I've been with CITUS Special Servicing since 2009. Previously, I was with GMAC Commercial Special Servicing. Um, our group has uh, gotten very active lately. We are currently um, assigned on 94 pools of loans, uh, various um, pool types, including SASB loans, uh, CLO pools, CSFRs, and uh, just the typical CMBS 2.0 product. Um, we're currently assigned, uh, are currently in our active portfolio have 90, or 55 loans totaling $3.6 billion. Um, we um, were rather slow uh, until very recently, obviously due to COVID. Uh, we've been very active as, as of late. Uh, we've recently hired uh, 10 new asset managers to work on uh, an increased volume. Uh, what we're seeing typically right now is uh, a, a lot of forbearance requests. Um, we're seeing uh, requests for uh, typically three to 18 months of forbearance uh, due to the COVID. Um, haven't seen anybody uh, approving 18 month forbearance was typically working out is uh, <clears throat> We're trying to pull from reserves typically. A lot of these are, we're consenting to. Some are staying in the master servicer level. We're working on them, consenting to them. Some are taking them special. And uh, again, we're typically in the three to six month uh, um, debt service relief uh, category, what we're, what we're approving right now. Um, and typically, again, what we're seeing is uh, the use of reserves primarily in cases uh, of actually deferring interest for a short period of time. That's all I have, Jim. Andy, go ahead. Hi, Andy Hunter Mark, um, CEO of Argentic Services Company. We are a uh, new entrant in the special servicing space. Um, we are uh, an affiliate of Argentic Investment Management, um, who has been a major BP Spire in 2.0, 3.0, as well as one of the largest um, non-bank contributors to CMBS. We are named on 18 um, Argentic-related or controlled uh, CMBS trusts, as well as uh, three CLOs uh, with a notational value of 16, 17 billion. Um, right now, we are uh, we, we took over from the prior third-party special servicer at the beginning of May, and um, frankly, we are um, coming up for air whenever we can. 
Uh, we're working um, well over 100 um, borrower requests, uh, primarily COVID related forbearances. Um, to echo what Kurt said, you know, 90 to, you know, maybe on the outside, 120 uh, day forbearance is primarily focused uh, on using reserves, but occasionally giving the uh, the occasional uh, uh, p and I uh, forbearance. Um, more and more stuff is slipping or coming into special servicing, either because the borrower's ask is is for significantly longer than that, um, or because they've um, the borrower or frankly. Uh, uh, Potentially on our end, things have delayed. They've hit the 60-day delinquency mark, and it's um, it's time to bring them in and have more serious conversations. I started as a lender um, many years ago, uh, which I will never know again after spending 30 years on the on the dark side. Um, went to work for an RTC, Sam the contractor. Um, then went to CW, where I spent uh, 15 years. The last uh, five or so as uh, head of special servicing. And then I started at Argentic uh, just about a year ago with the um, the edict to uh, start a special servicer. And um, that's what we've done, effective uh, May 6th of this year. So that's my story. Thanks, Andy. And uh, it'll be interesting to, to see where you take it from here. Ar Argentic has certainly gotten off to uh, an amazing start, zero to 60. Exactly. No doubt. Uh, Lindsay, tell us about you, please. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you sit. Um, I'm also a participant in the dark side, if you will. I've been doing this for um, more years than I care to mention uh, with actually the same company, just um, it's, it's various names and, and different predecessors all the way back um, to RCAP in the late 90s, um, then Centerline C3 and uh, Greystone. Uh, purchased uh, the, our special servicing plat, uh, platform at the end of 2019. And so I am Senior Managing Director with Greystone, which is a top uh, FHA, Fannie, Freddie lender, as well as a large asset management special servicing and servicing shop uh, named over, um, uh, provide servicing over $60 billion uh, worth of, of product. With regard to CMBS specifically, we're the main special servicer on about $14 billion. Um, I've got about $4 billion active in special oh, services gosh. at the moment. And um, about half of that has actually been transferred to us uh, post-COVID pandemic. So I have a very similar situation story as Kurt and Andy. Uh, we are drinking from the fire hose, as they say. We are, um, you know, just over the last few months been overrun with uh, different types of requests and just trying to parse through those and figure them out. Um, we're still in the early stages of, of this game, but um, over my um, history with all, with all the companies, you know, we've resolved over 60 billion. So this is in our first rodeo, but it's a much different one and um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Lindsay, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from you there. Tom Biafor with uh, Kilpatrick Townsend, and um, I guess I'll be less bashful than Lindsay. I've, I've been in the CMBS space for about 25 years now, um, generally really working on the REMIC compliance and PSD compliance side, as well as ancillary issues related to the REO issues, advancing, cancellation debt, and it's everything that sort of gets dragged in with that. And to kind of echo what Andy and Kurt and Lindsay have said, you know, during that time, we've been through some ups and downs for sure. We've been through two or three cycles, and, and we've seen various techniques emerge. You know, the AB note, the HOPE note was very popular a few years ago, and we've seen some other techniques, use, use of receiverships for short sales with assumed debt, but we've really never seen quite what we've seen these last eight or 12 weeks, and it's it's really stressing our documentation. It's stressing the way that we do things. I mean, everyone talks about drinking from a fire hose. That's certainly what we're all experiencing, but it's really putting us under the, the underlying assumptions about the way a lot of these securitizations have been set up under a lot of stress. So it's been a super busy three months, really evaluating a lot of the re requests that Kurt had mentioned and, and Andy and Lindsay about repurposing reserves or can we give a short-term deferral or you know what what can we do? Do we have to transfer the loan? 
And so it's really put all of that under a microscope and it's just been a it's just been a rock in twelve weeks as a result of that. Bob, can you take it from there? Thanks, Tom. Bob. Hi, so um, everybody, I'm Kaplan. I work in the San Francisco and uh, the hospitality group. I've been doing uh, critters rights work on the so-called box side and lender side for over 40 years. Uh, I've worked on dozens of CMBS loans, so with some of the people on on this uh, webinar today. Uh, loan workouts, Chapter 11s, forbearance agreements, receiverships, lender liability, defense, the whole gamut of uh, anything involved in representing lenders. And, uh, been through as that's Tom a number of cycles over 40 years, so uh, we've seen a lot of it. And um, uh, right now we're working on some hotel forbearance agreements and also doing some bankruptcy planning on some potential mutual bankruptcies. So that's where we're at. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm Jim Butler. As I said, I run the Global Hospitality Group at, at JMBM. Uh, I have been a hotel lawyer for more than 30 years. I used to think I did real estate and banking and securities, but I made a left turn somewhere in the 80s and started doing bankruptcies, receiverships, and workouts on uh, on hotel deals and sort of have never gone back. So uh, I don't work on a transaction unless it has a hotel involved. We have guys down the hallway that do the shopping centers and office buildings, but we have a real hardcore that is totally focused on office and guys like Bob also do detail uh, I didn't distress as well. Um, uh, in the good times, we do transactional matters. We help people buy, sell, finance, uh, reposition. We do management agreements, franchise agreements. Do a lot of litigation in, in these days as people get unhappy. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, value creation in helping people with the current challenges like they have. Um, Bob and I go back to the RTC days with Andy and some of uh, our other panelists when CMBS was uh, an idea that was first being floated and the RTC and FDIC were thinking about what to do with all these bank loans and how to get them off their, their books and into something they called securitized pools. And that, of course, was the birth of uh, CMBS. Today, it seems like hotels have become a uh, very important part uh, of the CMBS world and vice versa. Uh, it's been estimated that more than 20% of all the hotels in the U.S. have CMBS debt on them. And uh, ironically, uh, uh, hotels are the highest uh, delinquency and default ratio of any asset class. And they're running uh, delinquencies up 20% with retail at 18% right behind it. Those numbers are changing week by week. You can watch the track report on that. Well, all of this has, has caused a furor. Uh, there are, are so many articles around about, uh, many of them are urban myths. They're just plain misinformation. Articles uh, in the last week or two. Uh, things like uh, they talk about how CMPS is great in the good times with low interest, uh, but it's harder to work with CMPS lenders than it is with banks. Uh, that some say that CMBS lenders have a loan-to-own uh, approach, that these uh, they really want to own the assets, they don't want to work them out, uh, and that it's much more expensive to deal with CMBS lenders if you're a borrower and on the workout side. Um, some criticize special servicers, say that they don't know how to get a hold of anybody at the CMBS, that they there's no flexibility, that uh, uh, REMIC rules get in the way, and, and it goes on and on. It's funny, even some very knowledgeable people in the industry seem to be uh, under some misinformation about this. So uh, I'm going to ask Kurt to sort of jump on some of these uh, urban myths and, and thoughts, and then We'll ask uh, Andy, Lindsay, and, and Tom to follow on with anything he's uncovered. Kurt, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. Yeah, you know, honestly, it is going to be a little harder dealing with the CMBS special servicer, and uh, that's for a number of reasons. I mean, when you're working with your bank, there's been a relationship there for a long time. That asset is typically on the bank's books. Uh, there's, there's an ongoing relationship. You're often dealing with the the person who made the loan to you, 
it's a whole different world in, in, in a CMBS transaction. Uh, you're dealing with a master servicer or special servicer that typically had nothing to do with the origination of the loan, first of all. And you know, when you get to the special servicer, you know, our, our, our responsibility, our fiduciary responsibility is to the trust. It's not the borrower. Um, and basically, our customer is the bondholders and the trust. It's not the borrower. We're, we're going to you know, try to do what's best for everybody. And certainly, if we can get a win-win solution that, that makes everybody happy, that's great. But first and foremost, uh, we're going to do what's in the best interest of our certificate holders. So that's, that's, I think, the biggest difference between working with a bank and working on a CMBS loan. And it does get more complicated. We are subject to a pooling and servicing agreement. I'll, I'll try not to get too many, too much into basics, but you know we're we're a special service or we're a party to that servicing agreement. We have to service it a certain way. There's certain rules and regulations. There's REMIC rules that Tom could get into. Um, but there, there's a lot of uh, there's some flexibility, and then sometimes there's not flexibility. Uh, some things that would seem intuitively easy to do for us uh, isn't into isn't in, in actuality easy to do. So we have that issue, and then just at the end of the day, um, you know, we're looking for, we have the fiduciary responsibility again to, to maximize the recovery for our certificate holders. And our servicing agreement tells us to look at all alternatives on an NPV basis and, and try to quantitate, come up with a quantitative decision as much as you can, so that's what we do. And in, do, in, in so, so doing, uh, we do, uh, pursuant to our service and agreement, typically we're mandated to consult with the directing certificate holder, um, which is the most risky tranche bondholder in the, in the many tranches. And uh, so they have a say in what we do as well. So that complicates matters even further. But there are a lot of myths. I will say, uh, uh, Jim, a couple of the ones I've seen recently where uh, the PP, PPP loans uh, can't be, are not acceptable on a CMBS deal. That, absolutely a myth. Uh, you do need lender consent in most cases, but uh, that consent typically is not uh, typically hard to get. And uh, as far as loan to own and that, that myth, I would say uh, as far as the special servicing shops I've been a part of, that, that has never been a consideration of ours. So um, with that being said, I will uh, pass it along to Andy. Uh, I, I would echo a lot of what, what Kurt said. Um, I, I, two points in particular to, to, to make. One is the the loan to own that uh, has been touched on. Um, you know, these bondholders bought bonds that are part of a REMIC trust that holds loans. They are interested in investing in loans and loan cash flow. If they wanted to buy real estate, they buy real estate. They buy into a REIT. They buy into some other vehicle that would allow them to own real estate. So that's really the last thing generally bondholders want is for us to, to hold real estate. Um, but as Kurt said, we do have a fiduciary duty to uh, maximize recovery and to take the path with the highest net present value recovery. And sometimes that is foreclosure, Dean and Lou, um, moving forward with, uh, with an REO sale. Um, and I think the, the second point that just uh, deserves um, uh, reinforcement is um, is the communication level, both with borrowers getting to a decision maker, uh, which I know can be frustrating, um, particularly in these days when, frankly, the master servicers are drinking from the same fire hose we are. And while they may be larger institutions, they're not 100 percent devoted to master servicing. Um, I think people need to be uh, a bit understanding, but they also need uh, borrowers in particular need to communicate and uh, be honest with the master service or with the special service or provide the information we ask for. We're not asking for it because we want more paper. We're asking for it because we need it to make the right decision. And the right decision may go in the borrower's favor and it may not, but it, at least it'll be a decision. So. With that, I will uh, toss it to Lindsay. Thank you, Andy. Um, I don't have a, a lot of uh, a things to add to, to the discussion. I would just say that I think the takeaway from what both Kurt and Andy said is there are a lot of cooks in the proverbial kitchen. Um, there are a lot of uh, different parties that have a say or have their hand 
um, in the transaction with regard to a CMBS structure. So that's different than um, a typical, you know, portfolio or bank uh, lender that that some of the borrowers might be used to. Um, also, I would say that you know, communication-wise, you um, as a borrower don't have to be in default in order to start talking to your servicer. Um, I think that's a that's a myth out there that I've read in the journal and some of these articles and others is. Um, you know, the borrowers can raise their hand and start talking to these masters. We actually recommend that, suggest that, be proactive, get in and try to find um, uh, a, a good contact with the master who will then turn around probably and reach out to the special servicer, the controlling bondholder, um, to, to discuss the hardships and figure out the best course of action. So earlier the better, and no, you don't have to default, it's actually, um, you know, best if you keep the loan current, and um, we can get into that more a little bit later. But that, that's my two cents. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, thanks. And as an addendum to that, Lindsay, um, you know, the REMIC rules themselves do not prevent or require a default in order to modify a loan. And, and so much of what we hear and read in the press really relates to the to, to the problems that the REMIC rules cause. Um, we're, we're kind of letting the REMIC tail wag the dog. Um, just a little dirty secret here. With virtually everything we're talking about today, whether it's a PPP loan, um, some forbearances, modifying a loan as a result of a borrower's default or reasonably foreseeable default never has been and is not a REMIC problem. Uh, to be sure, there are a lot of REMIC issues that come up, particularly with REO property. And as an extension of what Andy just said, you know, we don't want necessarily to jump in and own every REO property. REO property is very difficult to operate within a CMBS structure. There's holding period limitations, prohibitions on new construction. It is not a good vehicle to run REO property by any stretch. So there's this misconception that you've got to default or the REMIC rules won't allow me to do anything unless and until I default, but only the special servicer can modify my loan because of the REMIC rules. That's just incorrect. Um, and in fact, the words master servicer and special servicer appear nowhere in the code and regulations, at least I don't believe they do, related to REMIC qualification and, and activity. So those, those concepts have just kind of emerged, I think, through maybe frustration or people have a tendency to hear what they, they want to hear. They don't get the request that they ask for and they think, well, it must have been a REMIC problem, all the while maybe not realizing that from the note holder's perspective or the special services perspective, it just wasn't a good deal. I mean, I looked at one yesterday, the borrower wanted a very basic forbearance as a result of a COVID-related distress situation. But they also tagged on this notion that, oh, by the way, I want to be able to pay off the loan anytime between now and maturity without having pre Like, no, you know, the COVID thing is one thing, but just tagging that along, why would we as a note holder agree to that? I have no doubt they think that's a REMIC problem. Oh, you can't pay off the loan in CMBS. You have to defeat your loan. No, that's, that's incorrect. But again, people hear what they want to hear. So, so much of one's experience through a lot of these cycles and what we're seeing right now sort of color their attitude toward these REMIC rules. There's no doubt the REMIC rules are problematic with REO. And I would say one area where we could use a lot of benefit is REO. Um, for all of you servicers, special servicers on the call, you've got to sell your REO that you got in 2014. It's got to be sold by year end, no matter what the loss, no matter what the market is. There's no additional extension option. So there is some inflexibility to some of those rules, but Nine times out of ten, it's going to come down to the issues that you, Lindsay, and and, and Kurt and, and Andy are really talking about. So credit issues, the PSA issues, what's my fiduciary duty and how am I going to run this this forward in the face of the documents and the obligations that I have? So with Thanks, that, you and I'll turn that over to you. Thanks, Tom. So um, let's uh, get into what's actually happening in special servicing right now from the servicers perspective. Um, Andy, you want to lead off this time and, and uh, to the extent we haven't already covered it, uh, uh, talk about what you're seeing in special special servicing today. Sure. Um, you know, I had a full head of hair a year ago and, um, and here we are. We're seeing, um, on a general basis, we're seeing from the borrower's perspective, you know, frustration, fear, anger, uncertainty. Borrower comes in, asks you for 90 days forbearance. They have no idea whether 90 days is enough. We have no idea. They can make up projections that say it's enough. But in some markets with certain type of 
you know, hotels uh, or retail, which is what we're seeing most of, um, you know, it, it, 90 days is, is not going to do it. Just because you open your doors or, or the county opens or the state opens, it doesn't mean people are going to come. And um, I think that's what everyone from the lender side and the borrower side is really wrestling with. And I suspect a lot of what we're doing now in terms of forbearances will circle around and come back into the shop at some point uh, for a, for another Band-Aid, a better Band-Aid, a longer lasting Band-Aid. Um, in terms of communication, I, I'll throw a free uh, ad out there for Crepsy for our trade organization, crepsy.org. They have a great uh, borrower's guide that gives um, it's a good roadmap to how to start the process of talking to your lender, and I'll use the, the term in general. Um, you don't have to go into default. You don't have to jump up and down and scream and yell most of the time. Um, it, you reach out to your, to your master servicer, which is who you're getting your bills from um, or your notices from, and you start a conversation. And, and as Lindsay said, that, that should... Um, be elevated to the special servicer, to the directing certificate holder, and a decision will be made whether it needs to come into special servicing for um, some type of significant fix or whether it can be fixed at the master servicer level or at the borrower level for that matter. Um, you know, 60 days delinquency gets you into special servicing, but we're working with uh, well over 100 borrowers who are current or 30 days or even 60 days and we've held off on transferring them into special because we're close to getting something done on a um, outside special which is much less expensive for the borrower uh, frankly much less work for us as a special servicer and um, you know I think uh, it at least allows a borrower to you know sleep soundly for 89 days <laughs> and worry about it on that on that 90th day um with with that i'll i'll uh, i'll throw it back to lindsay and uh let her expand on that thank you andy um yeah i agree you know for the borrowers and debtor reps on this call Please check out the Crespi, you know, guide uh, to borrowers uh, for the COVID pandemic. I, I do think it is very helpful, and it does help dispel some of these myths and, and give a roadmap, like Eve said. Uh, from Greystone's perspective, uh, we, like I said, we have um, have had almost two billion transfer into the shop for uh, you know COVID-related matters, and what I'm seeing is these are falling into really three different categories. One being um, uh, the request is more short-term in nature, as Andy was referring to, maybe a forbearance where they just need, you know, a few months, maybe using reserves um, in order to fund some of those debt service payments, and that's really it, not modifying any, you know, money terms, if you will, paying back at the end of that deferment period, not, not pushing that out. Um, et cetera. So there, there's that bucket. The second bucket is the one that um, I think most are going to fall into right now and still kind of, you know, playing out. But that's the one that's going to need a more complex, protracted uh, workout, um, you know, longer term um, uh, forbearance or modification, a maturity extension, um, you know, an IO period, things like that that are, like I said, more um, complicated and complex in nature. And then the third bucket is the one where the borrower just doesn't want to be part of the solution and what they, um, you know, are telling us they want to hand over the keys or they're not going to put one more dollar into the deal and, you know, that's when we've got to take um, uh, further action and pursue our rights and remedy when we loan documents. Um, and we can get into that more later too. But those, those are kind of what I'm seeing right now. It's still early in the game to tell you how a lot of it's playing out. We have inked um, some of those forbearances and use of reserves and approval of PPP loans, et cetera, um, that have all been mentioned in this phone call. We, we've definitely done a lot of that in these early days, uh, but we're still working through uh, the lion's share of, of these requests. So, um, Kurt? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, I, I'd say we're seeing uh, the same bucket 
uh, buckets that Lindsay's referring to, mostly the first two, the forbearance requests, the short terms, as Andy said, really we're seeing it as a band-aid, right? It's a, it's a three months, four months, and then let's wait and see, either pulling from reserves or deferring interest. Um, and we're, the the, the, the uh, number two bucket we are seeing is typically involves, for us anyway, uh, group business hotels, right? Those are Some of those were struggling pre-COVID. They're certainly going to struggle after, and that's where we're looking at doing more of a significant modification or restructure. Um, I will say um, one of the other issues we're seeing is um, one of the reasons to try to keep modifications uh, and forbearances uh, and of a short-term nature and not too material to start um, is to avoid um, having to move forward with third-party reports, including ordering appraisals. Um, appraisals have ramifications in the RIMIC structure or in the PSA structure. And one of those is um, having to uh, you know, order an appraisal. Uh, if it's a material modification you're doing, it's required to be ordered, and it can have um, ramifications for uh, payments to a bondholder. So we're keeping an eye on that. One of the reasons uh, the short-term look really works for us right now. But uh, we're anticipating as we look forward that you know many of these short-term forbearances will need to be readdressed considered based on what happens between now and say the third or fourth quarter. That's it, Tom. Sure, um, you know, really not much to add in terms of the types of requests that I've been looking at. A lot of repurposing of reserves, a lot that we would consider probably more on the kind of the innocuous uh, end of the spectrum. And, and what, what we are seeing, Kurt, and this kind of dovetails into what you just said, is that while we have much more flexibility to handle a lot of those requests, maybe on a short form basis without a formal transfer to special servicing, depending on what the individual securitization or PSA documents say, you may have an appraisal reduction event, you may still have to jump through a lot of the hoops um, that you were talking about that we're really keeping our eye on. So it's very document specific and one request that is very similar to another, depending on what the securitization requirements are. One maybe we can do without a formal transfer to special servicing. Um, one, we might have to transfer to special servicing. One might not trigger an appraisal reduction event, and one might. And it is very difficult to find a one-size-fits-all uh, approach on many of these things. And everyone likes to take the attitude, well, initially it started off with, well, a forbearance is just been a forbearance. It's really not a modification, nothing to see here, move on. Um, and that was sort of the initial. But then as people started digging into their pooling and servicing agreements, they weren't, they were less sort of unsatisfied with that conclusion. So then the approach really became, uh, well, the documents will control. But what they really meant was the documents will control unless they don't. Like we we're really taking a read to try and figure out how to streamline this and do what we need to do. So it's been a very fluid situation, but in the face of documentation that was designed to be much more flexible, we've encountered a lot of oddball situations where we find we have one foot on either side of the fence. That yeah, we can do it as a a non-transferred specialty service loan, but we actually do have an appraisal reduction event. So what does that mean and how does that unfold? Um, it really gets to your point, I think, Kurt, you, you made in your introductory remarks, is that there are sort of a chain reaction of events, that one event on the front end can have ramifications throughout the entire deal structure. And we have to keep an eye on that. In our effort to be more flexible and, and to do things maybe, I don't want to say on a short-term basis, but do it on a non-specialty service basis, we've actually made some more complications uh, farther down the line in that as well. So, uh, Jim or Bob, if anybody wants to add to that. Particularly when you're trying to get 10 pounds of gold dust into a five pound bag, you have some challenges. That's that's the problem uh, we're facing today with a lot of great information we want to present. Um, I want to get to what special servicers can do when hotel and retail projects have operating deficits and there's uh, threats of jingle mail. Uh, but before we get there, quickly, I'm going to ask Lindsay to lead off on any other of the considerations about being in special service, pros and cons, what are the costs, like, what are the major uh, uh, issues that, that you're seeing in special service? Please, Lindsay. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, I think that you know to uh, to echo what Tom was saying. Each pooling and servicing agreement um, that we as special servicers operate under are different. They're all none of them read the same. Um, so when a borrower has a request 
um, to the master servicer for some sort of relief, just know that it's not a one-size-fits-all as Tom said, and, and that you know it's going to stay at the master servicer or it's going to definitively go to the special servicer. It just is going to depend. I will say though that um, you know we are as a servicing community. I know um, from experience we are trying very hard to be flexible and to work with these borrowers and to work with the other servicers and get timely responsive um, responses back to back to the borrower borrowing community. So I know Crestie's done a lot of work too with regard to internal um, reporting between servicers to help it be transparent to our investors, right, who are the ultimate kind of uh, decision makers here, the controlling class, et cetera. So for the borrower community, you know, know when you do come in with a relief request and you want to get to the special servicer, and that's going to be officially transferred to special service, and there's going to be some costs and fees, you know, associated with that. Um, most of the loan documents, at least in the 2.0 um, era, have language in there that says the borrower is responsible for those um, special servicing fees and expenses that are incurred. So eyes wide open, um, you know, if, if you do come to special or even if you're at the master and you want a request for a PPP loan approval or you want that short-term forbearance in the master, if you do and the master has to hire, you know, legal counsel, there's going to be expenses there and there's usually some sort of, you know, um, fee associated with, with the work um, that the servicer is, is providing. And then um, as Tom mentioned and, and others, if you move in, move throughout the workout process, and we have to start ordering third-party reports, such as an appraisal, um, you know, environmental report, um, engineering report, et cetera, it might be where the, the borrower is responsible for those costs as well. So again, I just want everyone, you know, eyes wide open. The special coming into special servicing is not a you know a free ride, and you need to read your loan documents and make sure you understand what um, your responsibilities um, are um, speaking to borrowers there. Lindsay, a question on that. Um, what I'm seeing a lot more of, and I'm not sure what, what it is the product of, is these, these requests are coming in and they're written with an eye towards, hey, I don't want my loan transferred. You know, people do have their eyes wide open and they're saying, we don't want our loan transferred to special servicing, but we want you to waive yield maintenance and, oh, by the way, cut the principal in half and reduce the contract rate by two thirds. Um, you know, are, are you seeing that? And what is the motivation on, on some of that as well? Absolutely, Tom. Uh, we've seen that across the board uh, from the very sophisticated borrowers who have hired, you know, their legal counsel to write form letters that we, we get on almost every single one of their assets in our portfolio saying they don't want to come to special servicing, they don't want to pay any fees, but here's the laundry list of things we want, um, all the way down to the mom and pop borrower, you know, who says, who's scared, you know, maybe he doesn't want to come to special, doesn't want to be seen as, you know, in default, and but wants, you know, relief. Um, that's just a, that's a very um, you know challenging situation because a lot of these servicing agreements don't allow the master servicer to um, to do that type of request or consent to that. Uh, furthermore, it might not be something that we want to consent to. And you know, so the borrower, there's just some education that needs to be happening, you know, at the front end here, and that's what we're trying to do, trying to communicate with our master servicers. If we have to have a joint phone call with the borrower, it's not a special servicing yet, but that will help, you know. Um, uh, alleviate some of the uh, the myths or the the misconceptions. We're we're more than willing to do that. But you're absolutely right. We're seeing a lot of that, and we're also seeing from a certificate holder, a controlling class certificate holder perspective, saying, you know what, I don't want this loan to transfer into special servicing. Um, either say no, or can we find a way to to do something that keeps it out of of special servicing? So we're we're wrangling with all of those. Are there any particularly thorny questions that you're seeing in special servicing? This is really busy for you or for anyone on the panel. Uh, for example, uh, often distressed hotels are in danger of losing their franchise or their brand. Uh, on the other side, sometimes owners uh, feel that they can do a much better, do much better if they can change the brand or change the operator. How does special servicers look at brand changes, operator changes, and things like that? I'll um I can let Andy or Kurt you know weigh in on that if they if they want to if they see me this type of class. If not, I'm happy to do so. 
Um, yeah, I, I think generally, you know, we look at obviously you look at each request on its on its own merits, and I guess uh, everybody kind of has their opinions um, about different brands and different uh, flags within those brands. Um, so you really need to look at at uh, you know the type of guest that this hotel attracts. Is it business travelers? Are they putting an appropriate flag on for business travelers, or is it families? It's a convention business. You know, does does the flag they want to put in make sense? In terms of management companies, again, I'm sure we all have our lists of of great, good, not so good, um, and and. You know, you need to you you need to look at each one on it on its own merits, and and what experience do they have with this particular brand, with this particular franchise, or um, you know, are are they uh, are they a Hilton heavy management company, and you're asking them to go into a Marriott? Um, that might not be an ideal circumstance, but um, I think in general we're you know we're certainly open to the to the requests, and it's. It, Generally, it's one of the easier requests that we deal with, frankly. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, I would like to get some input on when do you appoint receivers? Uh, uh, who do you want to be your receivers? Do you go for receivers who also are hotel management companies? or uh, And what uh, do you like your receivers to have power of sale so that they can market a, a property? Uh, but let's get a little bit into what happens when there's the ultimate distress or jingle mail comes and suddenly you're, you're looking at keys or, or negative cash flow situation. Um, who wants to start with that? Kurt, you want to want to take that one on initially? Sure. We um, make sure I'm off mute. Yeah, we um, you know, we um, obviously, it, you know, it kind of goes back to pros and cons of being in a special service scene. I mean, we're looking at, I was going to say, there are some pros to getting in special. I'll, I'll just backtrack just quickly here. You know, it's, it's your opportunity to show uh, the special service. You're part of the solution. You're not part of the problem, right? And um, so that's a real good thing. If you can show that you're part of the solution, um, there's a much stronger chance we're going to work with you on something. Now, what happens a lot of times, we'll go out and we'll find out our borrower is really part of the problem. And even if I mean, maybe the restructure might not be viable at all because we think, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing. We don't think he's the best operator. In those cases, you know, we're typically going to pursue the receivership route. Um, we're not getting paid in any time. We're, especially we're not getting paid and we don't have confidence in the operator. Uh, typically, we will, you know, we use receivers that we've had a track record with. There's a few out there uh, that have worked with a lot of CMBS specials over the years, and that's how we select it. But that, that's typically what we're looking at. Any other in input on those considerations or uh, how, uh, what you'd like to see accomplished through receiverships? Andy, you have uh, anything? Yeah, I, I mean, we put receivers in for a number of reasons. It could be that you're in a state where foreclosure is a long and tedious process and you need to get in there and control the cash and, and uh, and take over or at least have a friendly party take over operations for you um, while you work your way through the foreclosure process. Um, you know, we've got our list of receivers that we like to work with. Um, some states don't care. Some states, you know, the judge's brother-in-law gets uh, gets the next receivership. Uh, and I think we all know what states those are. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as to whether we, we directly uh, petition the court to put in a hotel management company or whether we want an individual who in turn hires the company that we suggest um, really depends on the on the circumstances and I think in today's world it, it, over the next couple of months it's all going to also going to depend on how busy these hotel management companies get you know I'm, I'm as as Kurt and Lindsay are I'm sure besieged by you know um, experts um, who have their own companies or, or maybe lone, um, lone wolves who, um, you know, are offering their services to help with, um, with hotels. Right. And it's great, but there's a lot of distress and a lot of hotels are going to be in a lot of, a lot of hurt or in a lot of hurt. Well, and, and I, I think that, uh, that raises a question. A fair amount of our audience would love 
to buy distressed debt or provide capital for distressed hotels. Maybe they want a loan to own. Maybe they really are just looking for a preferred return. But there are a lot of folks who would uh, who are interested in providing their services as receivers uh, or providing their capital or buying loans. Who do they talk to? Do they talk to you? Are you interested in that kind of stuff? Uh, what should those people uh, do um, across broad categories? Receivers, operators, mm -hmm. capital. Speaking, speaking, uh, speaking for Argentic, um, we are not, and, and I don't see us being in a position for many months where we will be selling assets. Um, this is early in the game. We're trying, as we've talked about this whole session, we're trying to work with these folks, try to come to some um, resolution that makes sense for both sides. You uh, add to that the fact that courts are closed or have been closed and are incredibly backlogged. Um, foreclosure is going to be problematic, um, even in a state like Texas, where it's typically a 30-day from start to finish. You're just not going to get on the docket that quickly. So I think that um, you know it's going to going to slow the whole process down, and um, we are, as I said, still early in the game. We're not going to be looking to sell assets. I don't know, maybe by the end of the year, but I think that's probably optimistic. I think it's well into 21 before we um, are comfortable with uh, the execution in a, um, in a sale. That's what opportunistic investors do not want to hear, but it probably is very, very realistic. And the people who talk about the recovery being uh, somewhere between 2023 and 2025 before we get back to where we are, uh, that kind of time frame. Hopefully, it'll be faster, but uh, it may well be that uh, we aren't, don't really get around to the assets sooner. Um, Lindsay or Kurt, any different view on your interest? Uh, or your sense of timing on selling assets or introducing rescue capital or introducing borrowers to capital? I, I just want to, if Lindsay, I want to just make a couple of uh, statements. With regard to rescue capital, um, you know, equity, obviously um, those who want to provide it should be talking, you know, directly to the borrower in the, at, this, at this point. They're the owner and operator of the, of the asset. Um, and, and hopefully something, you know, can be done because when we are doing a workout with the borrower, as has been mentioned on this call already, we want them to be part of the solution. And that usually means they're going to have to bring some money to the table, either to bring the loan current or to help, um, you know, fund some shortfalls, et cetera. You're not just going to get a, an equity partner in your lender um, here and, and us fund everything. So I think that's kind of the first step. Secondly, with regard to when we're selling assets, um, as Andy was talking about timing-wise, I think you're exactly right. It's too early in the game um, to, to say when that will happen. I will say, though, that there's a lot of hotels that we're all dealing with right now that are going to be okay. Uh, when they're going to be okay, I'm not sure, but I think they're going to be okay. And so the whole you know, need for receiverships and property managers and taking title and all this, I think that's premature. Um, yes, of course, we're going to see that on some hotels, but for the majority of them, I think they're going to they're going to do all right. And we just need to give some sort of like we've been talking about forbearance modification uh, workout uh, to get them through these rough these rough times. I think it's Thank retail you. assets that are going to be the ones to watch for. Those are going to be the ones that I'm going to be you know needing receivers for to make sure we are protecting our cash and especially where the operators are just saying you know we're done the. the um, we, we, we can't fund anything anymore. And that's going to be a slower burn. Right. Uh, Kurt and any other panelists, uh, for those who want to provide their rescue capital or explore a purchase of the, uh, of the asset, how does that holder of all that money get to the owner? Uh, will you facilitate it? Are you uh, able to do that? Do they just go to TREP? How do they how do these people find the owner and make themselves available? Well, I, I think Lindsay just said, you know, we, we can't facilitate, you know, they're going to, we're talking to the borrower. If they want to talk to the borrower. That's fine. We're not going to uh, make that introduction. Uh, From a liability so, standpoint as well, that uh, your duties are to the, to the uh, certificate holders. And uh, we're not going to tell the borrower what to do or who to talk to. Right. Um, I would also say, you know, loan sales are a ways off. 
it's difficult for those to do for us to do those on a one-off basis without using a broker. Same reason we we don't really like to do a lot of DPOs unless it's a a, a really strong offer. We like to expose assets to the market when we, we do get to the point where we're liquidating through either a note sale advisor or auction firm or an REO uh, broker. So that's typically what's going to happen there. I will say um, on the last uh, downturn, we did do a lot of AB restructures with new equity involved. And uh, those were very successful at the end of the day. Those were deals that, you know, we entered into in 2009, 10, and 11. And we saw B notes, hope notes, paid off in full come 2014, 15, and 16. So um, I don't know if the circumstances are exactly the same now, but that's something that's worked in the past, and, and maybe there may be an opportunity there. Yeah. And Kurt, on that, two things I would add. Um, you know, that there are horses for courses for sure. I mean, I think that we definitely did have some success with some AB hope note structures. That is not the type of transaction that you can do just across the board. Um, the second thing is one of the things that's come up in that transaction is borrowers and, quite frankly, special servicers have a better understanding of the tax consequences associated with it, and we need to communicate those up front. When you take a fully unconditional note and, and split it into a partially contingent obligation, at the time you agree to do that, the borrower will, will get a 1099-C for cancellation of indebtedness income. So we're seeing that deal kind of get sidetracked just by communicating the, the tax implications up front. I'm not so sure back in 2011 and 12, we were as uh, upfront about communicating that. So I think I've seen many of those deals fall out because of that tax consequence. Thank you, Tom. Well, you're, you're, uh, you're right. You're right, Tom. I think people really ignored that piece of it. They walked away from the table thinking, oh, I got over, I got my note reduced. And then they get that little piece of paper at the end of the year, and it's like, oh, no. I yeah. did want to just take a second and echo what Lindsay said. I think that hotels were okay before COVID, are going to be okay again. We don't know when. That's the key. But, but they are going to be okay. Retail is more problematic and more long-term. And um, I don't think anybody knows where the, the end's gonna going to be there. Thank you. Um, let's uh, flip this over to Bob Kaplan. And Merrill, maybe you could put Bob's slide up for, for just a moment. Uh, Bob has two main questions that he's going to be uh, addressing. I think Bob and I worked with Kurt back in one of his iterations on some of those B pieces that uh, you talked about. And we did get 100% payoff on on that on uh, one of the San Francisco hotels that you may remember uh, Kurt back in the GMAC days or, or whatever. Um, Bob, these are two of the hot issues. Tell us uh, tell us what's going on and tell us where we can get more information. Okay. Uh, the first one uh, we're going to talk about is uh, single asset real estate known as SAR and who cares about it. So under the bankruptcy code, uh, if a uh, debtor that files is a single asset real estate debtor, the whole flavor of the case really tilts in favor of uh, you as the note holder secured creditor in terms of a relatively you know, quick exit strategy. So if a debtor holds a single asset real estate, which I'll talk about what that means in a second, uh, you as the secured creditor are entitled to relief from the stay unless the debtor does two things, which I'll mention, either one, 90 days after the case is filed, or two, 30 days after the court determines the debtor is a single asset real estate debtor. So that's a relatively quick exit strategy, regardless of the size of your loan. So if you file a relief from the automatic stay motion, and uh, the debtor is a single asset real estate debtor, then it's going to be granted unless two things happen within those time periods I've discussed. The first one is the debtor files a plan and has a reasonable possibility of being confirmed in a reasonable period of time, one option to the debtor. Or two, which is good for you, uh, the debtor has to make uh, interest-only payments to your contract rate. Uh, based upon the value of the interest in the property. Now that's an important little qualification because value of the interest doesn't mean loan balance, it means the value of the secured claim. So if you're oversecured, it's not really an issue, but if you're undersecured, the debtor only has to pay you a market rate of interest on what the value of the collateral is. So uh, if you don't have a single asset real estate debtor, then basically you're stuck into the normal nightmare of a protracted and expensive Chapter 11 case. So uh, you can get into some litigation in these single asset real estate cases uh, to determine if the debtor has no cash, if the plan uh, has a time. There's a lot of people on the call uh, on the webcast know 
Most bankruptcy judges in the last downturn in 2008-2009, they had very little tolerance for single asset uh, Chapter 11 cases going on for months and years at a time. And generally, uh, even uh, pro-bankruptcy uh, debtor judges don't want those cases sitting in their docket for years. So, what is a single asset real estate debtor? Well, there's three things that happen. One, the real property involved in the case has to be a single piece of real estate or project. That's pretty easy to determine. Two, the real property must generate a substantial in all of the gross income of the debtor. And three, the debtor must not be engaged in business other than the operation of real property. So the classic single asset real estate debtor is an apartment building or office building. If you're involved in one of those, you have a single asset real estate case. And when the debtor files, they have to fill out all sorts of forms. If they have an honest lawyer, they'll check off the box on the bankruptcy petition saying they're single asset real estate. So that gives you a leg up right away. So uh, the definition of single asset real estate, though, uh, becomes much more difficult when you're dealing with hotels and resort properties. And rather than get into a lot of legal issues, I'm just going to give a couple of examples of how the court treats these issues. So let's assume you have a large hotel with a restaurant, bar, spa. Uh, you're going to basically lose an argument that it's a single asset real estate debtor. Most of the courts uh, will come down and say, it's a very active business. This is not like an you know, owner of an apartment building or office building. And they do much more than just generate income from the operation of a real property. So uh, in those kind of cases, uh, you're probably going to be stuck in the normal long chapter 11. Uh, most of the cases that I've seen and been involved in, when you have these large resorts and hotels, they are going to be determined not to be single asset real estate debtors. Additionally, when you have like a golf club or marina, you're also going to have a problem. However, there are some cases that you're going to win in this situation. Uh, if you have a smaller hotel, like a Comfort Inn or a family-owned hotel, really the only thing the hotel is doing is renting rooms for the night, no other real services, uh, maybe if you pay breakfast in the morning, you have a shot of winning the argument that's a similar set real estate case. Uh, some other good examples are uh, we have a case where we have a 23-room boutique hotel with a restaurant and a bar and a spa. However, in that case, these uh, businesses were operated by affiliates of the debtor who were not in bankruptcy. And the court held in that case that that's a single asset real estate debtor. Because all that debtor is doing is operating real estate and engaging in real estate. So you have to analyze the structure of what you're involved in. So what does all this mean from a secured creditor? One, uh, if you have a case where the debtor doesn't check the box that says it's single asset real estate debtor, you generally want to have your lawyers file a motion as soon as possible in the case to make this determination. Because then it's just the whole uh, tenor of the case in your agreement. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, when you're negotiating uh, some of these restructuring agreements or forbearance agreements or modification agreements you discussed, see if you can get some language in the document someplace where the debtor says, I am a single asset real estate debtor. Get some admission in writing. That way, when the case is filed, if there's a dispute about it, you can point that out to the bankruptcy judge. If it's not binding, but if you have a sophisticated debtor with sophisticated counsel and good documentation, a good judge may say, well, wait a second, uh, the consideration was the forbearance that you admitted you're a single asset debtor. How come you're not a single asset debtor now? So the last thing which I'll talk about and wrap up with is uh, single purpose entities. Uh, most of the CMBS loan documents have what we call uh, bankruptcy remote provisions which supposedly make it difficult for the bar to file bankruptcy. And you can't file bankruptcy unless an independent uh, uh, director votes to file. So how do the courts react to stuff like this? Well, unfortunately, not particularly well. Uh, the independent director requirement runs headlong into the principle that anybody who's done lender's work knows you can't waive the right of a borrower to file bankruptcy, and the bankruptcy courts are supposedly open to anyone who wants to file, and any of these waivers are void against public policy. So there's been a lot of uh, bankruptcy court review of these uh, DRE uh, independent director structures. And once again, I'll give you some practical examples. So in one case where the uh, secret director actually won, we had a manager management and liability company where all members of the LLC had to vote to commence a bankruptcy case. And the LLC filed bankruptcy, but one of the members didn't vote for it. And the motion was made by that member to dismiss the case. And uh, believe it or not, the court granted the motion and said the LLC members were free to contract among themselves to require everyone vote to file a bankruptcy case. So this was not void against public policy because uh, and also the lender was not involved in the structure. 
the opposite result was reached in another case where we had a manager manager with a limited liability company where we had an operating agreement that the lender approved and uh, the operating agreement required that uh, the independent manager uh, both to file bankruptcy and the independent manager uh, basically had no management or fiduciary duties through the limited liability company. Uh, basically, the court found that this provision was to quote, cleverly insidious and was really a blocking mechanism to protect against the bankruptcy filing, especially since this member didn't have fiduciary duties to the other member, which typically occurs in an LLC. So uh, where we come down on all this, uh, these bankruptcy remote provisions, uh, if the lender has been involved in setting up the structure and it's clear that the independent director is just a blocking director, they're probably going to lose any motion to dismiss the bankruptcy as an unauthorized filing. However, if you have a truly independent director and there's no evidence that the lender is manipulating the LLC agreement and the independent director votes against the filing, you've got a shot at dismissing the case. But in general, my experience in trying to enforce these provisions is most of the time the lenders are involved is not particularly good. So we have to hope that maybe you have a single asset real estate case and you can get a bankruptcy quickly. Thank you, Bob. Uh, by the way, Bob and I co-authored those articles probably uh, 15 years ago, Bob, originally. We updated them around 2010, and there was not much law on either one of those questions. There were one decision going one way and one decision going another uh, on each of the questions, the what's an SARE and, and uh, what devices work on preventing bankruptcy filing. But in the last 10 years, we just updated this in 2020, Nick Delancey, Bob Kaplan, and I, we published these. Those links that you just saw uh, are articles on hotellawyer.com. They're up on the blog, and they will be in the materials today if you want to check them out. We normally don't put a lot of legal citations in our blog articles, but uh, we thought that was such uh, valuable information. I know we have a number of lawyers on the panel. If you want it, they will. They, those citations are available. So I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed this panel as much as I have and we have in presenting it. We will have a recording of the panel available in the next few days. It will be on hotellawyer.com. That's our main website. Go to the tab on hotellawyer.com. That's called Resource Center and then under industry presentations. Uh, we'll probably also have a blog up about it, just summarizing. I want to thank each of our panelists and want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Bye.